Here we are back for chapter two of our arthropod uh, videos. In chapter one, we just did an overview of arthropods in general. Here in chapter two, we're going to do specifically looking at uh, the crustacea, the arachnids, and the insects, looking at some of the more specific um, uh, characteristics. Um, basically, a quick run through uh, of these uh, three classes. And we'll start with the crustacea. The crustacea are in the subphylum Mandibulata, as we learned last time, uh, class Crustacea, so phylum Arthropoda, subphylum Mandibulata, class Crustacea. And examples are crayfish, lobster, crabs, and shrimp. We know that these animals are, for the most part, uh, aquatic, uh, many of them marine, uh, and we know that they are, like all arthropods, highly cephalized. They have well-developed heads. You can see uh, distinct heads uh, with sensory and feeding structures, and their mouth parts are jaws, uh, thus the subphylum mandibulata. Uh, the crustacea have well-developed nervous systems. You can see these sensory antennae here, uh, very distinct eyes that they use to uh, um, sense their, um, their, their environment. Uh, and let's see what else we have. When we look at the internal anatomy of uh, the crustacean, we use the crayfish as an example, we can see a complete digestive system, of course. Uh, a brain, a simple brain, with a ventral nerve cord, a nerve cord that runs down the belly side, which is kind of interesting because if we look at uh, human anatomy, our, our nerve cord, our spinal cord, runs dorsally. Uh, and conversely, they have a dorsal heart, a heart that's near the back side, which again is kind of flip-flopped over from a human anatomy where the heart would be uh, more towards the ventral surface. We don't see it in this diagram, but these aquatic organisms uh, do have a gas exchange system. They have gills that they use to extract, uh, to exchange gases to and from the water and the body. Uh, and like all arthropods, they have an open circulatory system, which can limit them in terms of either size or activity level. Uh, and certainly, they can be both large and uh, active with an open circulatory system. I want to point out one new organ that we haven't seen before in our trek through animals, and that's the green gland. In the crustacea, up in the head region, there's a gland that if you were to look at it, it's actually green, like a little green pea, and it's associated with these blood vessels, and its job is uh, to extract the waste products out of the blood for removal from the body. You can see the gland here, and this duct or tube that would lead that waste out of the body. Basically, this is the corollary structure, the analogous structure, uh, to uh, the kidney in our body. And we know that like all arthropods, uh, the crustacea have a hard exoskeleton made of chitin. But we also know, and if you've ever eaten crab legs or peeled shrimp, you've dealt with that exoskeleton, that in many of the crustacea, that uh, exoskeleton, that chitin, is also kind of reinforced with uh, calcium to make it a really hard, thick exoskeleton, uh, which helps uh, for protection and also kind of carry the pressure of the water pushing down on them. All right, so let's move on out of the crustacea and move to, oh, one other thing I want to point out about the crustacea is the location of the mouth. Uh, and this may be not the best diagram for this, so I may draw something over here. But uh, the location of the mouth gives us a little bit of a hint as to the type of feeders or the lifestyle that they live. Um, an animal that's predatory will have its mouth out in front. And think about why. I mean, you got to be a predator, you have your mouth out here when you're finding food in front of you. But for the for the, um, the crustacea, if you look at their head, uh, the mouth is kind of up underneath the body, uh, oftentimes, and they'll have their their eyes and their antenna out here. But the mouth will often be on the underside of their body, uh, and that tells us that these crustacea are scavengers. They crawl along the the bottom of the ocean floor, searching for food, and they crawl over top of their food source and eat it from underneath, rather than a predator would have its mouth out in the front. Uh, please don't be distracted or overwhelmed by my amazing artwork up here. I'm at home on my laptop uh, drawing with my mouse rather than at school on my smart board drawing with a pen. Uh, not that it would be much better. Let's move on to uh, the arachnids. So we're in the phylum Arthropoda, subphylum Chelicerata, class Arachnidia, common name spiders. 
So we all know what spiders are. Uh, when we look at a spider, the generic spider body, we see two very distinctive body segments. We have the cephalothorax, which is the head and the thorax combined. We have our sensory systems there on the on the cephalothorax, as well as all of our appendages are are, are for walking um, are attached to this this first section. And the back section, the abdomen, is going to house a lot of our internal uh, organs. Um, we can see that we have the chelicera, these pincers up front, and these spinnerets, which are going to be for spinning webs. And I'll pull up a different picture. This one's a little better. You can see this unique ability to spin silk. And they use their webs, uh, obviously, to trap food and also to make nests uh, and that sort of thing. Um, when we look at the, the well-developed sensory systems, we can see these compound eyes, which are multi-part eyes, and these sensory hairs that help them uh, sen sense the environment, um, the well-developed sense systems, which is important because if we think about the lifestyle of an arachnid, they're predatory, so they have to be able to find their food and, and be able to receive uh, stimulus input from their environment. We know that kind of defining spiders is that they have eight legs, uh, four pairs. They also have extrasensory appendages, but those are not for locomotion. As we move to the internal anatomy of the uh, spiders, of the arachnids, we can see a complete digestive system. It's something interesting about the way that the spiders feed. Uh, they don't bite and chew their food. In fact, they actually drink their food. A uh, spider will bite their food and inject into it through their fangs a digestive enzyme that will kind of liquefy the body of their prey, and then they kind of slurp it up in a like a slurpy mixture. I think that's kind of interesting. They have a, a, suck, a suction uh, stomach that sucks that material in. Um, when we look at the gas exchange, I want to point out something interesting because in the crustacea, the aquatic organisms, we have gills, but uh, spiders are terrestrial, so they have to have some structure that can exchange gases on land, and they have what's called a book lung. You can see it here. It's called a book lung because it's, uh, it's folded. It has lots of folds that look like pages of a book. I want you to think about what lots, lots of folds get for us. The more folds we have, the more surface area we have. And the more surface area we have, the better uh, gas exchange surface we have because we can have more absorption, more diffusion across uh, a large surface there. So we can have uh, in one structure a great deal of surface area across which to have gas exchange. Only other couple other things to point out are certainly we don't have to learn all of these uh, parts here, but I wanted to point out the malphigian tubules, um, which are the excretory organ, which is the corollary of the green gland in the crustacea, and of course the corollary of kidneys in uh, your anatomy. In your anatomy, so we see up here the malphigian tubules, uh, which are uh, drawing out those waste products uh, to eliminate them out of the body, getting rid of those metabolic waste. I just made a point of showing that uh, spiders show internal fertilization, meaning the uh, the gametes, uh, the male gametes, placed inside the female's body. And I want you to think about why that's important, um, as opposed to an external fertilization, which usually requires water. There's your big hint there as to why. Since we're using the arachnids to represent all the uh, chelicerates, the chelicera subphylum of the arthropod phylum, we should just at least look at the other chelicerates, include the scorpions, the ticks, uh, mites, uh, like dust mites, uh, and the horseshoe crab. And be careful with horseshoe crab because crabs are crustacea, but the horseshoe crab is actually more closely related to the spiders. It's a, it's a chelicerate rather than a mandibulate like the, like the crustacea. Now let's move on to the class Insecta. Insects are the largest class in the animal kingdom. They make up approximately 80% of the total number of animals on the planet. They include things like bees and all kinds of bugs, beetles, flies, ants, grasshoppers, butterflies. So the question is, what's made the insects so successful? Why are they, why did they, why did they do so well? Well, there's a couple reasons. One, they're highly modal, which means that if the environment goes bad, they can pick up and move. How modal? Well, of course they can they can walk and run, but and hop like grasshoppers. But the evolution of flight that we see in insects really kind of gives insects a leg up as far as motility compared to uh, the other animals we've seen so far. So highly modal. Let's just move to new environments if the environment we're in uh, has gone bad. Also, a high reproductive capacity. They can reproduce in large numbers and and often, which gives them a better chance of survival. And finally. The social behavior, social systems. We know that uh, animals can have very complex systems. We 
got some insight into that if you watch this classic movie, A Bug's Life. But, you know, that's a movie, and it's not real. But uh, it's based on the fact that ants do show some very complex social systems. And if you think about the, the nature of a beehive, where you have bees with different jobs, and everyone does their job, and it's best for the social order, um, we can see that that could aid in the, the success of, of insects. Let's move on to some other things. When we look at insects, we see three very distinct body segments at the head, the abdomen, and the thorax. So the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And the head is specialized, obviously, uh, uh, for sensation, uh, sensory systems, and feeding. The thorax is the body segment that all legs or wings attach to. So it's basically designed for locomotion. And the abdomen houses uh, the other large internal organs. We know that uh, insects are highly cephalized. They have well-developed heads, very obvious heads with complex sensory systems. And insects are in the subphylum mandibulata, so they have mandibles or jaws. We see well-developed nervous systems in the insects. And again, that's going to make sense. If you're going to be as modal, if you're going to fly, something as complex as flight behavior, you better have a nervous system that can support the the coordination of the complex muscle movement that's required, and also just good sensory systems. Uh, if you come in to land on the tree and misjudge that because your your nervous system isn't well developed, you're going to have a hard time being successful as a flying animal. When we look at the internal anatomy of insects, we can kind of use a grasshopper as our kind of poster child for all insects. We know that like all arthropods, we have an open circulatory system, yet insects can be fairly active. We've got to think about why that's the case. Uh, like the arachnids, we have the malphigian tubules uh, to get rid of our excess um, nitrogen waste, our metabolic waste. But the other thing I want to look at, and I need to kind of zoom in here, if you look at the body of, a, of an insect, you'll see uh, little holes on the outside of the body, like right here and right here. They're called spiracles. Let me mark this. They're called spiracles, and they're the openings to the body, which actually are like venting. There's little vents that let air go into the body. Let's think about what that's used for. Each of these little openings actually leads to a tube or a system of tubes called a tracheal system. This is the gas exchange system of insects. And if we look at this picture down here, uh, let me move this up a little bit, um, make this a little bigger. If every one of those openings on the outside of the body that we could see um, right here would be one of the openings and here leads to this highly branched system of tubes now a lot of branching gives us lots of surface area lots of surface area gives us lots of diffusion and it allows gases to be exchanged so this branch system throughout the animal's body is basically like a, an air conditioning system an air conditioning ductwork that lets air pass through their body and when it does we can exchange carbon dioxide for oxygen so that's their unique gas exchange system. It's called a tracheal system. It shares all the qualities that we pointed out in our mollusk unit, or our mollusk video, about what makes for a good gas exchange system. In our mollusk video, when we first introduced gas exchange systems, we said that they all had these qualities of having a large surface area. Well, lots of branches, we get that, check. Moist and thin, well, this is a microscopic picture, so we can assume thin, and since it's inside the body, more than likely moist. Protected being inside the body which is surrounded by an exoskeleton you're certainly protected but what about vascularized well in this case we don't need it to be highly vascularized because the vascularization the, the blood vessels deliver the gases but this system is so branched throughout the body that it is in itself delivering also uh, if we compare that maybe to the book lung and let me go back for a second in the book lung of a spider we have the gas exchange system kind of centralized so we would need blood vessels to carry those uh, those gases away from the system uh, to other parts of the body to help deliver it but the tracheal system does the delivery itself and of course we know that all insects have to molt to exchange that exoskeleton for a larger one as they grow the last characteristic that insects share uh, is that insects all undergo a process of metamorphosis means change and meta means middle so some point in the middle of their life they change they change their shape and we have two versions of this metamorphosis we have complete metamorphosis uh, where we go from an egg to a larval stage 
into a pupa where we're changing into the adult. And all you got to do is think of the life cycle of a butterfly from an egg to a caterpillar into the cocoon and then the adult stage. And what's interesting in this is that we see a division of labor where during the larval stage the focus is on eating and growing and then in the adult stage the focus is on reproduction. In incomplete metamorphosis we don't have the a larval stage or a, a pupa stage. We go from an egg which matures into a nymph and a nymph is basically a miniature version of the adult but the nymph is uh, sexually immature and usually if the adult has wings the nymph will not so as they gain their wings and become adults they also reach a, a, um, sexual maturity and then can reproduce when you're back to the egg and in our final wrap up and for, to be ready for any type of quiz we may have uh, don't forget uh, millipedes and centipedes. Certainly I want you to know which is which. Chilipoda centipede, all you have to do is remember that uh, they both begin with a C and the, that means the diplopoda are the millipedes, but really think about diplo die. There are two legs on every body segment and the centipedes have only one or one pair of legs. Two pairs of legs per body segment, one pair of legs per body segment. That's the difference between the diplopoda and the chilopoda. And there ends part two of our arthropod videos.